this is the last session, but not uh, but the subject of it, I would say, is as important as the rest of the panels today. We're going to talk about capacity building. And what does it mean, capacity building? Because, you know, it's kind of a buzzword. Well, we use it quite often, but I guess, and that was referred in previous sessions, that every transition, be it, you know, economic, social transition, also the energy transition, needs experts. And to have experts, we need knowledge, we need skills, we need to train them. And we need experts not only for the reason that we need people who share our ideas and views, but we need experts to be able to push things forward. So uh, this panel will uh, focus on how to build capacities of people, different capacities, we're going to talk about it, and how to accelerate, and not only accelerate, but materialize the transition in a way that it's really a just transition and that it's shared not only among the experts community, which is, I would say, quite I mean, relatively easy task, but first and foremost, that the just transition is shared among uh, local uh, communities. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speakers for today. Uh, Roberto, Roberto Mantero from uh, Digineer, Taix. Roberto, good to have you here. Uh, Magdalena Havua from the World Bank. Uh, Mirnes Bajtarevic, municipality of Kakań, Bosnia-Herzegovina. I hope I pronounced it properly. Uh, Mirza Kuzgluic from Reset, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, Aurora Popova from the Ministry of Economy from Kosovo. And last but not least, Piotr Sofauka, Institute for Econology of Industrial Areas, Poland. We will have uh, three, or actually three and a half presentations, because one presentation consists only of one slide. That's what I've been told. So without further ado, <laughs> I'd like to start with uh, Roberto from TAIEX, just to share, uh, I mean, well, the one thing which I forgot to say is that we, we plan to have two rounds of questions. The first one focuses on where we are, so what's been achieved. Uh, and the second round will focus on the future. So what is needed? What are the uh, prospects for uh, building uh, these capacities which we need for, for, um, uh, for the just transition? So Roberto, the floor is yours. And I guess we don't have the clicker, so you have to, you have to speak loudly so they can hear you, back them, and change the slides. OK. Uh, thank you, Olaf. And uh, thanks, uh, everybody, for attending uh, this session. So I'm here to present uh, the technical assistance uh, information exchange uh, uh, tool of the European Commission uh, that uh, is an instrument to provide, as you can see uh, in the next slide, uh, to provide uh, the uh, short-term uh, technical assistance, meaning uh, two, three days, or let's say maximum five days in, uh, uh, on very specific topics to uh, the countries uh, that are partners to the EU. So here we are covering uh, all the uh, uh, well, neighborhood south, uh, neighborhood uh, uh, east, and uh, uh, the Western Balkans. Uh, and uh, in our nature, let's say that it's very important, uh, uh, and our focus is really to provide peer-to-peer -peer expertise, in the sense that uh, uh, this tool is uh, designed uh, to support public administrations, uh, and we provide expertise that comes from uh, uh, public administration in uh, member states. Another characteristic which we are pretty proud about is the fact that uh, uh, TIEX is an instrument that can be fastly deployed, and uh, this means that uh, it can uh, uh, work uh, nicely as a first step to uh, well, provide information uh, to uh, our partner countries. The aim of uh, TIEX is uh, focused on uh, uh, favorizing, favorizing uh, legislative alignment uh, to increase the knowledge of uh, the European acquis and uh, know, uh, I mean, uh, explain also to country how to transpose and uh, uh, implement those uh, legislation in their national ones increase the knowledge on the European standards and show uh, best, uh, the best practices that uh, are uh, around. 
uh, all of this we can call it uh, uh, institutional uh, building, uh, which let's say it's a form of capacity building. In the next slide we can see how we do that in practice. So we can provide assistance through uh, the organization of uh, events. Uh, these can have uh, different formats according also to uh, their, uh, uh, let's say, aim. So we go from uh, workshops uh, that are more informative for larger audience. But uh, I would say that the um, format that we use the most is the format of an expert mission. So uh, where we select uh, two free experts for a longer period, five days, uh, which deliver presentation on a very focused uh, uh, legislative aspect or a very focused uh, issue. Uh, uh, and so we um, prefer to have uh, people from the beneficiary side uh, more uh, active on the technical, uh, on a technical side. Then we have also uh, study visits where delegations from uh, receiving countries visit uh, projects in the member states to see what can be implemented on the ground. Of course, uh, the um, uh, local authorities are eligible, but in order to be able to absorb uh, all the requests, uh, uh, we prefer to focus on uh, what we call the flagship events or let's say, um, let's say larger and uh, thematic events uh, uh, where regions are grouped and discuss on uh, uh, a, a certain uh, a topic that is common from, uh, uh, for everyone. On the next slide, uh, we can see where we work and uh, in, in terms of policy areas. And I would say that TIEX is really the instrument that can cover uh, all the spectrum of the European acquis. Uh, we organize more or less 1,000 events, uh, 1,000, let's say, project of uh, technical assistance per year. And uh, as you can see, uh, a good part of this, let's say one third, is about the green and uh, digital transition. And in any case, uh, there uh, uh, you have also the link to look at all the events that, uh, that we run. And in the next slide, uh, um, this is how we work in practice in the sense that uh, on one end, uh, uh, our uh, main job is really to provide uh, experts from the member states. We have uh, uh, a database, a huge database uh, with several thousands of experts. Uh, everyone can, uh, every expert from a public administration can apply. Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, rounds uh, of uh, validation uh, to see if the expert is relevant. Uh, and uh, after once uh, we select the experts for a specific project, uh, we, um, uh, we negotiate an agenda with uh, the experts, the beneficiary parties, in order to, uh, all, to be all on the same page. And uh, uh, depending on the setup chosen, uh, we uh, arrange the logistics through our providers. Uh, so this is also to support the countries. Of course, uh, this is a co-creation process, so we need from the countries uh, and uh, or let's say from the regions applying uh, some help, so a stable contact points, uh, support or basically taking on board the whole pro process of registration of participants and the selection and supporting uh, uh, their agenda, the, the, ag the drafting of the agenda. Just to conclude, uh, uh, in the next slides, um, some information on how to apply uh, for uh, regions and countries. First of all, uh, very important, uh, uh, in each country here represented in this room, uh, there, uh, there is a national contact point for TIEX, mainly in the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, reach out to this person uh, and uh, he or she will be able to uh, uh, support you in uh, drafting an application. Then uh, the application uh, uh, is pretty straightforward. It goes uh, through a formulaire that, that you can find uh, on uh, our website. And uh, uh, from there uh, you will enter, uh, we will receive your application or we will go through a process of evaluation and if approved, we'll be able to uh, start working on, uh, on your, uh, let's say, on, on your request. Thank you, Roberto. One, one question. Uh, is it only available in English or also other languages? 
I mean this application form? It's uh, mainly available in English. In English, okay, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, and now I turn to Magda Lena Havua from the World Bank, uh, who is also a very important institution, actually just together with the World Bank, the College of Europe, uh, prepared a, a series of, of learning uh, lessons. I guess Magda will refer to that, so Magda, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm glad to see people are still interested in capacity building, though we exercise it so much uh, uh, on, in our daily work. So uh, let's skip this slide and also we can skip the other one because it's just a description of the platform. It's made for people that did not participate but would like to look at the presentations later. So I'll get to the point. Learning Academy for coal regions in Western Balkans and Ukraine. That idea came up uh, back in 2019, I think. Uh, and we plan to do it in a face-to-face -face mode so that people can come, get together, network like we do today. Unfortunately, there was a COVID uh, situation and we had to change our plans, but it's a fortunate and not fortunate event at the same time for the Learning Academy at least, because we decided to go with this uh, um, learning exercise via uh, online modules. Therefore, more people can actually use it, more people can access it, it can be broadly applied and uh, can give basis to people to learn more about Academy. I can speak, uh, and I will in a moment, about what's in that academy, but just for the moment, please look at that slide, because the, the presentation is there mainly because of this slide, so that you know how to register. You need to go to goxi.org, which is a, web, a web, website of extractive industries uh, managed by the World Bank, and if you register, you can see initiatives, then choose the platform in support of coal regions in transition Western Balkans and Ukraine, you can read about our platform, our initiative, and then at the end you have a link to the Learning Academy. The Learning Academy, the Learning Academy, you can find there are six online courses, each created of five modules. And there are three horizontal courses. I think Marek already mentioned that yesterday, Marek Tabor from College of Europe. But let me repeat, hello Marek. Um, so there are three horizontal courses and it's on uh, people and communities, and it's on uh, environmental issues. The way the, we structured in the, uh, to, to mirror basically the methodology of the World Bank with the three pillars. So governance, in people and communities, and environmental issues and repurposing. And those are horizontal, so you can learn pretty much the basics of you know what are the actions in just transition to take in that field. And then we have a little bit deeper dives, dives in, and those are three other courses, again, responding to the pillars, but with a, a little bit more technical inputs. The way you go for it, you register for the course, you, you can read, you can listen to that course, and then once you complete, there is a little bit of quiz to answer, and if you complete the course, you, you're you can get a certificate of completion. So maybe that's useful for your CV, maybe not, but you know, we wanted to give you something for the effort. Um, and we think that, you know, it's useful for, for people to, to broaden, because sometimes we think we know everything, but if you read those materials, you can find so many references, so many interesting ca cases, that it's worth to have a look and, uh, and, uh, and go through, 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 through it. Uh, you cannot just freely fr go through those courses because it's, it's a e-learning exercise. You have to go one by one to get there. I mean, you can pick the course, the topic of the course, but once you pick the topic of the course, you have to go from one module to another to complete. So it's a typical... Cheating is not allowed, basically. <laughs> yeah, cheating is not that much allowed. <laughs> But basically, that's, that's there. Uh, there are also resources in the Learning Academy where you can find interesting uh, reports. Uh, right now, there's mainly uh, so-called knowledge packages, which were prepared by our friends. And those are like uh, reviews of uh, main liter literature for the topic. So you can also have a look, because we thought that giving just links to different reports then you're sending people into nowhere. It's good to give them an abstract, 
so that they know if they can find in that report what they are looking for or not. So that was our thinking and this is what we have done. So we have a list of, of, uh, of lit literature and uh, some abstracts uh, ex or, or, or executive summaries of it. Uh, where you can find out what it is about. Also, like a main glossary, because some people, you know, there are some terms we use we use in just transition and nobody knows what they are. So there, you can find that there too. Uh, if you have any, know in any interesting reports that you think should be there, you can always write to me, send the report, and we can upload it in that uh, quite big, you know, space that we have there. So this is one thing that we've prepared to support capacity building in the countries. Unfortunately, I will say it's for the moment only in English, but uh, we'll see if we can find a way to make it more accessible to people that do not use that language. And I'll go now to the second slide, which is, uh, oh, it's pretty much a continuation of the Learning Academy, so let's go to another one. And now uh, I'll speak about uh, different exercise that we have. It's also a uh, knowledge exchange. So we have organized within the platform uh, a pilot project with on, on, uh, on knowledge exchange between Poland and Ukraine. And uh, you can see sometimes, uh, I mean, first three courses uh, were, uh, study visits were online, then the second one and uh, the fourth one and the fifth one were face to face. As I always say, it's interesting, COVID, COVID stopped us from meeting face to face, but the war didn't. Um, and even though it was minus 12 degrees, our Ukrainian participants were still eager to see the solar farms and you know any other examples of transition that we had to present for them. So big kudos to all, of, all those that participated in those visits. And uh, we also organized some uh, knowledge exchange between India, interestingly, India and Poland and India in Ger and Germany. So that was also interesting to la later hear their, um, their views on what was uh, interesting or adoptable in their country between like, you know, experience from Poland and experience in Germany. And we still send them some ex examples uh, so that they can apply in their country. There was a Bosnia and Herzegovina a virtual exchange program with Appalachia USA, and that was led by, by my colleagues from, 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 from our team. Um, on the slide, you have detailed the information on which topics uh, it covered, but pretty much, again, we follow the, the matrix that we have with the three, three pillars on institutional governance, people and communities, and environmental um, reclamation uh, or, and uh, repurposing of land. So those are the things that we do to build capacity building in those smaller mini programs, you know, ad hoc support that we can provide. Uh, but we also do provide capacity building on daily basis in our projects that we run with the countries. Uh, it's embedded in our like uh, footprint, you know, of the World Bank sharing knowledge and uh, bringing the capacity up. But maybe I'll speak about it more in the second round of the uh, panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Magda. Now, uh, let's go a bit uh, down and focus on the local perspective. And I would like to ask uh, Mirnes uh, Baitarevic uh, from the municipality of Aliani. How does it look from your point of view, I mean, uh, what it takes and uh, how you look at the capacity building at the local level. Venus, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I will speak on Bosnian. Hvala vam prije svega na pozivu na današnji sustret. U narednih nekoliko slajdova ja sam pripremio nekoliko podataka o našoj maloj lokalnoj zajednici jer smatram da na početku prije svega treba da vas upoznamo sa nekim stvarima koje se tiču lokalne zajednice i onoga što pričamo u okviru pojma pravedna tranzicija. Znači, općina Kaken se nalazi u Bosni i Hercegovini, centralni dio Bosni i Hercegovine sa nekih 37.000 stanovnika i 50 km od Sarajeva, glavnog grada. Uh, industrijski grad, možemo preći sljedeći slajd, next slide, please. 
Mi na našem području, na području naše općine imamo i rudnik mrkog uglja, i termoelektranu kakanj, i tvornicu cementa kakanj. Znači sve ovo što mi pričamo u okviru pravedne tranzicije, općina Kakanj ima na ovako malom području nekih 350 km2. Oni su u principu ujedno i kao takvi stubovi razvoja energetskog sektora prije svega Bosne i Hercegovine i vjerujem da su jedan od pokretača industrijske proizvodnje u cijeloj Bosni i Hercegovini. Next slide, please. Kada govorimo o termoelektrani, ja sam samo stavio nekoliko podataka da imamo radi nekog osjećaja o čemu pričamo. Znači, termoelektrana Kakanj je jedna od dvije na području općine Kakanj. I kao što vidite, 1991. godine prije ratnih dešavanja imala je 1203 uposlena, danas 2022. 2023. Ta brojka je oko 577 do 600 uposlenika. Vidite i samu proizvodnju i vidite koliko su uglja u odnosu na 1991. i danas, koliko je ta brojka smanjena, koliko smo spalili u ovoj termoelektrani. Sljedeći slajd, molim vas. Rudnik mrkog uglja kakanj ima svoj površinski dio i ima jamu iz koje se vadi ugalj. 1991. imali smo 4.832 uposlenika, u ovoj godini ta brojka spada ispod 1.300, znači 1.263 u ovom trenutku. Vidite da je smanjena proizvodnja gotovo za duplo u odnosu na onaj period 1991.-2022. godina, što možemo vidjeti da u termoelektrani kakanj, pored ovih milion tona koji se kopa u kaknju, Potroši se, izloži se još od prilike milijon tona koji se kopaju u drugim rudnicima mrkog uglja ili drugih rudnicima u okviru Bosne i Hercegovine. Sljedeći slajd, molim vas. Kad je u pitanju gradski sistem daljinskog grijanja, naš izvor tople vode je u stvari termoelektrana. Mali broj uposlenih nemaju puno, ovdje možete vidjeti broj korisnika. I ono što je najbitnije jeste specifična potrošnja od 215 kW po metru kvadratnom, što smatramo da je jako, jako veliko. Ali u okviru procesa pravedne tranzicije, ovo je sektor na kojem želimo vjerovatno i najviše raditi, obzirom da u trenutku kada dođe do prestanka rada termoelektrani ili rudnika, onda će biti ugroženi sistem daljinskog grijanja koji evo grije 270 hiljada kvadratnih metara i otprilike 3400 naših korisnika. Sljedeći slajd. Šta je to što nas najviše zanima u ovom svemu? Jeste u stvari, ja bih izdvojio ovaj srednji dio, a to je socijalni aspekt samog pojma tranzicija. Iako ja ću biti iskrena, o tome ću malo kasnije pričati, ja u ova dva dana još uvijek nisam shvatio šta je pravedna tranzicija, šta je energetska tranzicija, šta je sama tranzicija jer u okviru ovih radionica već nekoliko puta čuli smo da ovaj dio Balkana prolazi od 30 godina, prolazi nekoliko puta sve neke tranzicije. Prije toga je bila prijeratna, pa posljeratna tranzicija, pa smo onda imali tranziciju prodaje naših javnih preduzeća za certifikate i to je jedan dio tranzicije. Tako da smo mi narod koji je vječito u tranziciji, a i nikako ne znamo kako da izađemo iz same tranzicije, zaista mi je pojam pravedne tranzicije u ovom trenutku meni kao načelniku, a vjerujem 80% naših sugrađana još uvijek nepoznat i teško objašnjiv kada pričam o ovom pojmu. Ono što je specifično jeste u stvari da u okviru ove dvije kompanije, a pričat ćemo samo termoelektrana i rudnik, trenutno je uposleno znači od prilike 2000 radnika, a pored toga u uslužnim djelatnostima, pratećim djelatnostima za njih radi od prilike još 1000. Što znači da je to otprilike 12.000 naših stanovnika koji su direktno vezani za rad ova dva velika energetska sektora. Zbog toga je naš strah onoga što će se desiti do 2050. godine zaista veliki i zaista su pred nama veliki izazovi koje treba da prođemo, stvar na koje treba da odgovorimo da bi smo na neki način došli do zamjenskih radnih mjesta koji će pokriti to izazove. Ja sam svjestan da će određen broj ljudi prirodno otići u penziju, 
prestati raditi, otići u mirovinu, ali isto tako ostaće jako veliki broj onih mladih koji sada radi u ovim industrijama za koje trebamo tražiti rješenja u, u narednom periodu. Molim vas, ako ima još jedan slajd. Ovo je ono što mi vidimo kao budućnost i mi smo već na tome počeli raditi. Kakan je mala općina, ali i tekako ulaže u poljoprivredu i privredu. Prije svega vidimo se kao turistički kraj, obzirom da smo blizu Sarajeva i možemo biti jedan od njegovih hubova, obzirom da najveći broj turista u Bosni i Hercegovini dođe u Sarajevo. Jedino smo skijelište na području centralne Bosne, Zemljičko-Dobojskog kantona, tu vidimo svoju priliku. A naravno, obzirom da je Kakanj kraljevski grad, želimo razvijati turizam u smislu posjete stranih i domaćih turista naših kulturno-historijskim spomenicima, kao i vjerskom turizmu, obzirom da se na području naše općine nalazi najstarija džamija, najstariji Franjevački samostan i jedna od najstarijih pravoslavnih crkva kao turizma kao predstavnici sve tri konfesije u općini Kakanji i u državi Bosni i Hercegovini, na kojima želimo graditi, naravno, našu budućnost. Ono gdje vidimo naš potencijal jesu i geotermalne vode, njihove izvore imamo na području naše lokalne zajednice, temperatura te vode je otprilike od 35 do 53 stepena Celzijusovi, usuđujem se reći nedovoljno istraženo, ali to vidimo kao jedan od mogućih izvora za sistem daljinskog grijanja u našem gradu u trenutku kada termoelektrana prestane sa radom. Eto toliko. Hvala vam na strpljenju. Naravno da ću biti sudionik svega onoga što moderator tokom ove sesije bude pitao. Hvala vam, mayor. 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 Tell you, I mean, whether people are with you on this just transition, on the whether just the how they understand this just transition, or you don't have this, you know, sort of information, which seems to be one of the basics. Mi mi nismo radili klasična istraživanja, ali kao načelnik i lokalna zajednica mi smo na uslazi na raspolaganju našim sugrađanima svaki dan. I mi svaki dan sa različitim grupama i pojedincima pričamo o pravednoj tranziciji. Zato sam na početku kazao da naši ljudi još uvijek ne razumiju pojam same pravedne tranzicije, jer obzirom da smo mi industrijski grad i mi imamo običaj reći rudnik je kakanj, odnosno kakanj je rudnik. Rudnik postoje od 1902. godine i kod nas možete sve reći, ali da kažete da će se rudnik zatvoriti, E, to vam je najveći grijeh. Ljudi jednostavno ne razumiju i neće da prihvate tu činjenicu i zbog toga je izazov naše lokalne zajednice i drugih lokalnih zajednica, općine Živinica, Banovići, Tuzla, Zenica, Breza, i tekako puno veći nego one lokalne zajednice u Bosni i Hercegovini koji nemaju industriju ovakvog tipa. So I understand this is a matter of local identity, actually, and part of the you know your history, uh, which is, I mean, quite often the case with 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 cold regions. I mean, the same as in Poland and many other places. But now, I mean, uh, going, I mean, uh, also developing on this, not local, local but national level, going from this you know strategic, uh, global uh, level of of the European Commission, the World Bank. I like to ask. Uh, uh, Aurora Popova from the Ministry of Economy of Kosovo. I mean, how, I mean, what is your take on this, you know, the, not only capacity building, but how you understand the just transition and how you, what you achieved so far in terms of building, you know, some uh, necessary uh, measures or, you know, frameworks or capacities just to, to implement it. Aurora. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm happy to see these many faces in the last panel. Indeed, I only have one slide for you. Um, if we can have it on screen. Yeah, can we, can we have the slide? No, this is not the one. <laughs> Do we have the slide or? 
No? Okay, I'm sorry. I was <coughs> Indeed, it only has problems. the three main documents okay. uh, from which everything else derives related to energy and the rest is history. No, um, no we don't have it. No, it's no worries. Um, <laughs> okay, so that we had the Secretary General yesterday um, mm -hmm. Uh, present presenting all the uh, job done in Kosovo in the past few years or at least in the last um, two years and we have three main documents uh, which are the national development uh, strategy uh, which foresees the economic development um, of course pillar in in Kosovo including the energy and the environment and then we have the new energy a uh, national energy strategy, uh, which was long awaited, and now we have the most important uh, strategic document uh, to to rely on, and and then uh, the NECP or the National Economic and Climate uh, Plan. I would say, starting from the national energy strategy, uh, which specific objective 4.3 says training in energy related to training in energy related and women's inclusion uh, which foresees the um, training in energy related jobs and of course as I said the women's inclusion or at least a minimum of, of up to 25 percent and then the NSCP itself um, under the employment effects, it foresees the national uh, uh, scaling up trainings for and trainings, skilling and reskilling as well. Um, of course, as you may know, we are a lignite um, reliant country, um, but the strategy foresees at least uh, not to use one block from uh, a. Uh, power plant anymore and then refurbishing the others and use them or at least keep them in reserve uh, while on the other hand working hard on renewable energy sources for more than uh, 30 percent uh, in the 2030. At the meantime uh, there are many projects ongoing uh, trying to reskill and um, train professionals in this uh, in this regard. Uh, I'd like to mention a couple of them, uh, but and also share with you uh, two projects for which I was uh, appointed to coordinate, and I had the honor to coordinate last year um, under the NEPAC office, which are the Solar for Kosovo um, uh, PV or, or uh, solar power plant and the Solar for Kosovo district heating. Um, these two projects are under the, under the WBIF, uh, the framework, and with grants from WBIF and also having our partners, um, KFW, EBRD, and EIB. For both projects, 150 megawatts, um, which account for up to uh, 200 million uh, euros. This is only the first step and what I'd like to emphasize is that one of the projects, the 100 megawatt project, uh, the power plant in Kosovo, will be managed by KEK, or the Energy Corporation in Kosovo, which also manages the uh, lignite power plants. In this case, I know many of you um, have discussed and now seen the mindset switching as something in the past, but I, I think it's also ongoing. Um, because having all the people in this corporation um, face a new project with, which is only renewable uh, energy uh, uh, reliant will be switching their mindset as well and having them thinking for new jobs and not only uh, those uh, as they are used to uh, related to lignite and the power plants. This is one thing um, that I'm, I mean, as, as uh, th that we're happy in Kosovo to see this happening. And then on the other hand, we have other projects and people that were trained. Um, so under the Ministry of Finance, uh, Labor and Transfers, um, the um, employment agency uh, has eight vo vocational training centers, uh, which uh, up to now have trained 19 um, professionals for uh, uh, PV 
uh, and the energy sector, and also they force, so now they have the module in place and they foresee to scale this up for the next seven to eight years. Um, this is a good news because once the module is there and now is, is all set, um, it can be replicated uh, in all these uh, employment uh, training centers. At the same time, um, as mentioned yesterday, we have the MCC project with 202 million, and 16 million from that is um, for the development of technical assistant, assistance and small grants to energy sectors employment, employers sorry, uh, under the Just and Equitable Transition Acceleration Project. So one uh, part of, of uh, this huge investments will be only for, for JETA, uh, this project, which also foresees the trainings only uh, focused on women. Also, this foresees other, uh, other um, objectives as well, increasing female representation in the energy sector, promoting gender equitable uh, practices within companies, supporting networking, mentoring and training, and the, the one that I just mentioned, the technical assistance and the small grants. Um, I would say what is being offered at the moment also is um, as part of the energy package under EPA 3, uh, it was mentioned before in the panel as well. Um, Kosovo is implementing a 75 million project under this uh, energy support package. And we have, as the ministry, we're implementing um, the energy efficiency measures for the residential sector and also, for the first time, for the private sector as well, as well uh, MSMEs um, this year. And under the, these measures, uh, we foresee the um, solar district heating measure and also the solar power plant. Uh, so, sorry, so solar uh, PV uh, uh, measures. Since this year, we have the regulation of prosumers in place uh, from the regulator. We are now free to move on with projects and uh, subs providing subsidies for the uh, businesses and SMEs this year so that they can uh, accelerate and, and uh, move on uh, um, their business, businesses either uh, using PVs for the businesses that have all, that all are already and installers that are already working on it, but also for the others which um, see this as an opportunity to uh, either implement these projects, but also switch from other jobs to uh, renewable energy sources. These are s the, these are some projects uh, more practical that I'd like I like to share with you. And in terms of what is uh, next, uh, I think. We'll check that in, yeah. the second round. So, so now I'd like to go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to go back to Bosnia Herzegovina again and uh, ask uh, Mirza Kuzlujic from Reset if you could tell us a bit more about the Reset, what is it, and how you work, and also share your view. Thank you, Olaf. So thank you. For the, thank you for the invitation. Uh, even though I participated at the two online conferences and uh, I follow up the initiative from the very inception four years ago. I even was somehow involved in uh, uh, the application of the European platform. However, I'm not an actor. I'm an onlooker. I'm someone uh, who comes from a think tank and what RESET means is uh, regional sustainable energy transition, focus on sustainable. Uh, my first intervention here is uh, the slide I made slide this morning. Uh, this is a recently published analysis, just a few days ago by Reset, and uh, is the results of the research by more than 100 experts from six countries of the region. We really wanted to look whether the European Union and international financial institutions framework, which was explained to a certain extent in a few days here, will start uh, coal phase out, to be very specific. Not will it start renewable scale up, but will renewable scale up or the framework will result in a coal phase out. Uh, 
the the result is uh, the result is visible from the title of the study. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, the title is quite strong, isn't it? The title is chaotic. I think it uh, doesn't need to be explained. The local politics is very chaotic. I don't think the international policy is much more organized. I will explain that. And the fake, uh, the fake is uh, on purpose. Uh, you hear from the politicians. I used to be politician. You hear from the politicians, yeah, we are determined. We signed the Sofia Declaration. Yeah, we will decarbonize. And then when you ask them, where is the date where you exit? The best answer yesterday was when the coal will be stopped use, when depleted. That was the best for me. Or I was joking with the friends from North Macedonia, how to repeat the example of North Macedonia, yeah, where you deplete your coal reserves. That's what happened in North Macedonia. Uh, it's a clear, clear state. I mean, you have to. And you listen and you hear the mayor of Hakai. Uh, he doesn't dare. He can come here, but doesn't dare to go publicly and say, in 2041, the thermal power plant and the coal mine Kaka will not work, which is basically in our national energy and climate plan. So uh, it's a good to be in the last session. Then you can reflect upon. Uh, I will just want to comment a few things. There is no just transition without energy transition. I have seen energy transition without just transition. I'm old enough to remember Margaret Thatcher energy transition without just transition. So just transition is not happening in a vacuum. Just transition is happening if it's ideologically and uh, strategically directed to be people-centered, not money-centered. The title says this is not the case in the region. That what is happening, uh, projects, money, big projects, big money. I haven't heard, which is the essence of the just transition, I haven't heard about citizens, citizens' communities, local governments, small and medium-sized enterprises, how to activate money of the people. If you look, what is the passive amount of money people that, in that people in the region have on the accounts, savings? And we're not talking about millions, we're not talking about people, we're talking about consumers. We are talking about uh, energy communities. So unfortunately, the conclusion is something has to be changed. Something strategically has to be changed, and I encourage you, if not just as a provocation, to read what uh, we have uh, identified and what we have suggested. What basically we suggested is design sustainable energy transition, which is not only decarbonization, which is also decentralization, democratization, digitalization, and, and, and the rest which we call in reset sustainable sustainable energy transition. And just a few remarks on what I heard also. There is expectation that CBAM will kickstart coal phase out through carbon pricing. And then there was the idea of regional carbon pricing. Uh, uh, our conclusion, the, 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 the finding of the experts is it's not. CBAM, CBAM is seen and promoted by opponents of the transition as a punishment. The region is part of Europe, and we have European Green Deal. We don't have EU Green Deal, we have European Green Deal. We should incorporate the Western Balkans. So instead of punishment, taxes, we need partnership. The last recommendation is, let's sit together, let's really design a feasible path for coal phase out in the region, which will also be based on equal footing with the other countries in the region, Southeast Europe, who are members of the EU. And we carefully followed what has been happening in the last 10 years, not just us, but our colleagues in the mining industry in Poland, in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Greece. And the tipping point, whatever you think about ambitions, interests, etc., the tipping point is the framework of the EU and everything that being a member of the EU means, including technical, financial assistance, and solidarity. Solidarity of the rich EU countries with the poor or less developed EU, EU countries. So 
maybe reality check. I will be in the second uh, intervention more positive. Okay, Whenever good. I discuss so we can people, so we can end up on some positive notes. Yeah. Pessimistic. <laughs> no, this is uh, first not mine uh, opinion. This is what uh, people from the region, experts from the regions, try to provoke politicians, both on one and the other side, to think: Is it really so rosy as uh, we have uh, been uh, frequently hearing? Yeah about uh, money-centered decarbonization of power sector in the Western Balkans. Well, thank you, Mirza. I guess reality is never rosy, but as you mentioned, I mean, there is, I mean, this is the process which is part of the enlargement process as well, yeah, or should be at least. Yes. Uh, and now, last but not least, I'd like to refer to Piotr Sofauka, and now we can have, oh yes, this is the presentation, uh, Piotr. Over to you. Thank you, Olaf. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you organizers for a possibility to be the part of this panel again. Um, um, I'd like to talk about uh, the involvement of our institute in a project that um, helps build uh, capacity for our partners from other countries. Um, uh, Marcin Jamilkowski mentioned about the project financed by National Fund of Environmental uh, protection and uh, water management. Uh, we have been the part of this project together with the World Bank, of course, uh, which was responsible for uh, logistic part in this project. But uh, first of all, I would like to uh, give you some um, picture of our region. Um, so I'd like to start from the history. Uh, as you probably know, if not, I will mention that uh, transition in our region, which is the main coal mining region in Poland, lasts over 50 years. Um, in 50 years ago, we've had 65 coal mines. Today, it's only 17 in our region, and the other one in uh, Lublin. Uh, as you can see, uh, more than 30 years ago, it was over 400,000 people uh, employed in coal mining industry. Today it's less than 70,000 in our region. Uh, and the production was huge because it was almost 200 uh, millions of tons. Today it's 44. But what is important for us is also the uh, emission that comes from f uh, fossil fuels, uh, that comes from industrial, um, uh, which is the industrial emission. It was really huge 30 years ago. It was over 90,000 of tons of particle matters. Today, last year, data from 2022, it's three and a half for the whole uh, Silesian voyage ship. The next slide, please. When we talk about just transition, of course, um, we've got the territorial just transition plan because we are the main uh, region with, that is beneficiary of uh, just transition plan uh, in Poland. But there's, of course, uh, the national level of this uh, process planned. And um, here you can see the main aspects that have to be, that have to appear in, uh, in just transition plan. It was mentioned today in many presentations, in many interventions that, first of all, uh, all stakeholders have to be engaged, all groups, administration, local governments, uh, entrepreneurs, um, scientists uh, to that, that uh, can also deliver uh, the knowledge uh, regarding innovation, innovative uh, technologies. When we talk about innovative technologies, some of them, of course, uh, um, can be developed in a region, and this is uh, added value, but uh, in the uh, case of innovative technologies, we need the access to these technologies. We have to be able to implement them. We have to remember about environmental protection and restoration. A lot of uh, assets that come from coal mining industry need remediation and reclamation. Uh, we have to assess the quality of these uh, assets. We have to remember that um, the industry based on uh, fossil fuels uh, influences also air quality. Uh, 
capacity building, what we are discussing now. Uh, we have to build our capacity building, but uh, we can also share our experience, our knowledge with other partners to help them build capacity as well. And scientific cooperation is very important. In our case, when we are realizing uh, the project that uh, was finished uh, in the middle of this year, we have involved also other scientific partners, for example, Central Mining Institute that was responsible in our um, project for uh, technical and technological aspects. Next slide, please. Uh, we've got in Poland the uh, social contract uh, that uh, uh, was agreed with uh, trade unions. And here is a slide uh, delivered by trade union Kadra, and it shows how many coal mines we've got today and how uh, this coal mining industry will be phased out until 2050. As we can see, today we've got 17 uh, coal mines in our region, an additional one in the Lublin region. But uh, coming to 2049, there are only four of them in our region. Then the next slide, please. Um, I represent the region that is a main beneficiary of uh, Just Transition Fund for Poland. As you can see here, there are four regions that are beneficiaries. Uh, 2.4 billion is dedicated for Silesia and the part of Małopolska, to the western part. And uh, uh, I'd like to um, um, mention how it is planned in the territorial just transition plan and how we, being a part of EU, we are a beneficiary of uh, EU support. Please, next slide. Here you can see that from the beginning, when we were in the uh, European Union, our region was supported uh, by uh, European funds, mainly by ERDF and ESF. And in this perspective, the most important component of EU support is JTF. Uh, this uh, fund is um, um, programmed in our territorial just transition plan that is based on three pillars. You can see here numbers, uh, what uh, amount of uh, um, this uh, dedicated fund is allocated in economy pillar, in environmental pillar and uh, social pillar. Uh, here is also the uh, flash how it looks uh, regarding allocation of this money um, from JTF. There was the first call um, with, uh, the, 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 there were first calls, 28 calls, that for October uh, 2023 uh, delivered over 1,000 proposals with total allocation of um, um, over 1 billion of, of uh, euro. Uh, the money dedicated for this call is about 800, uh, 800 uh, millions. And now we are at the stage that projects are evaluated and some of them will be chosen. But of course, it is a challenge to uh, prepare projects and to uh, spend the money that is dedicated from JTF from, for the region. And the next slide, please. When we share our experience, uh, we try to uh, show the history of transition in, in our region. And I think that uh, the, um, the best example from our uh, region is the history of hard coal mine Katowice that was located in the center of the city. On this uh, timeline, you can see that almost 10 years took to prepare investment that uh, well, the part of uh, construction of our uh, Katowice culture zone. Three elements of this uh, zone are uh, Silesian Museum, Polish National Radio Symphony Orchestra, and International Congress Center. Very important is to be prepared for big projects like, like this one. Uh, when we are ready to um, um, implement the project, we have to be uh, 
Mm, we have to be uh, sure that we can use the area for all um, investment that are planned. Here, we can say maybe it's not a bad example, but uh, uh, the problems that, that have appeared here uh, have been connected with uh, um, landowners. So it was very important to prepare to uh, agree between Katowice city and the company that is responsible for restructuring coal mines, uh, who owns the land, to prepare land reproposing and to uh, realize the investment. On the last slide is uh, actual culture zone that is located um, in this place where it used to be the central uh, Katowice uh, coal, coal mine. This investment uh, involved uh, almost 225 million of euro. I think that we can also show other examples because we have a lot of uh, communities in our region that used to have coal mines that uh, um, um, made repurposing for this land. Some, in some cases, also elements of coal mines became um, um, objects of new uh, facilities. And a good example is also here the uh, Hard Coal Mine Museum in Zabrze, uh, Guido Coal Mining, uh, Queen Lu Luisa. Thank you for this part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piotr. Yeah, it's a, it's a lovely area. I can. Confirm, just been there many times uh, before and after uh, all that change you, you showed to us. Uh, uh, Roberto, you you uh, you said you you very much focus on uh, experts, uh, mi expert missions, and also study visits. And uh, but what are the? I mean, do you do you uh, encounter any like shortages in terms of you know? accessibility of experts, you know, this human capacities on the other side. I mean, how do you deal with that? Because I guess there is a limited number of people, yes, you can you can have access to. Roberto. Yes, so, well, let's say that uh, in TIEX we are lucky enough to have, uh, uh, let's say, a huge database in the sense that TIEX has been an instrument that uh, has been working for almost uh, 30 years. It was inaugurated in 1996, and hence we have a database of experts that I don't know the number, but it's of several thousands. It's true that uh, there are sectors, I'm thinking uh, from my recent experience, like energy storage, mm -hmm. where uh, the number of available experts, and uh, uh, it's important also to remember that these experts need to come, uh, let's say, at 99% from the public sector, mm -hmm. public administration. In, some, in, in energy storage, we might have a shortage. So. This is also a call for uh, people in the audience uh, or uh, uh, online. Uh, uh, there is a possibility to, to register, and uh, and there, uh, yes, there will be for sure opportunities uh, to, uh, let's say, to work together. I have to say that until now, uh, it never happened to me to not find experts suitable for the requests. But uh, in some cases, uh, yeah, when I talked about a fast deployment, it can be a bit slower uh, because of finding the right person. Uh, uh, it's not always easy. And how about the private sector? Does it contribute to it as well, or it's or you mainly rely on, on public sector? It's it's mainly public sector. We can have on exceptional basis uh, 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 experts coming from uh, the private sector, uh, but this uh, needs uh, it's really when uh, uh, we are in uh, let's say severe difficulties. In Why is it so? It's about legal framework or because lack of interest on the it's, uh, No, it's, it's our mandate. It's the mandate of TIEX is really to be on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, so it's conceived as an instrument from public administrations to public administration. Uh, there can be a presence among the audience, uh, albeit limited, uh, to not go out from our mandate, but uh, in the audience we can have representatives uh, of a private sector and, uh, uh, let's say, civil society, but, let's say, the focus is always on the public, uh, public sector. Okay. So, so basically, well, at the same time, just we all know that this, you know, the, the new energy, I mean, the new sector is actually just very much business oriented and privatized here. Yeah? So are there any discussions or ideas like, you know, in the future that you perhaps open 
or create more room for, for private sector? Let's say that uh, in, the, uh, in the past months, uh, especially that, that we've been starting discussing on this uh, uh, internally, nothing has been uh, decided yet, but let's say that there is uh, a degree of flexibility that is uh, definitely higher than, uh, than in the past to include uh, experts from, uh, from, from the private sector as well. Okay, thank you, Roberto. Uh, Magda, you, you, you mentioned, I mean, the, 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 the language question, if I may put it that way, yeah, but this is only the, you know, the tip of the iceberg just when we think of the you know, future, future steps. So how, how, I mean, from, from the World Bank perspective, uh, how you see, uh, what are, you know, like, you know, your ideas how to develop these capacities, how to reach out, uh, you know, new audiences, especially the local ones, because I guess this is a recurring pattern of the discussions, yes, that when we meet in Brussels, you know, in Washington DC, some other places, we more or less, I um, mean, United, just we know, we share uh, uh, not only the view, but we have the same level of knowledge, but when we go down to local municipalities, actually, then actually the momentum is not even there, yes, so it has to be created, so how the World Bank looks in the future uh, when it comes to capacity building with, with the nation state or local level. Well, it's true that for the transition to take place, first of all, people have to be aware of the need of the transition and they have to have capacity to actually implement it. So um, the way we think about it, it, those kind of platforms like ours is very useful and actually World Bank is now working on a uh, similar platform for uh, for Southeast Asia so that uh, more and more people gain knowledge and uh, uh, build their capacity on what the just transition is and how can it, it be implemented um, so in this sense uh, the learning academy in within this initiative was created to build those capacities to make the knowledge available also those knowledge exchange programs with the study visits were there for for that reason but um, capacity building is kind of like part of our daily work with we call it clients or basically countries um, when we do a project with a country whether it's technical assistance which is obvious capacity building but also investment projects we kind of give this uh, hand holding so there is a so impl uh, implementation support therefore you're not left to you know do everything by yourself but we we go we, we kind of are there for you to help you implement those solutions and those investments um, it's um, it's let me go back a little bit uh, because sometimes before the investments come there has to be this awareness and capacity building so we do technical assistance and there uh, we create um, not only like you know teaching experts that work with us from the counterparts but also we we prepare uh, manuals toolkits um, we create networking opportunities for those people to to learn more and uh, of course sometimes we learn from the client from, from the client from the from, from the experts on the ground because okay the world bank has a huge knowledge <laughs> and great experts but there are also some innovative solutions on the ground and we're always very happy to hear them um, what is important is that we spoke a lot about the local level uh, in this initiative that it has to be bottom up and it has to create you know some kind of energy um, but there is this issue of projects that are not being prepared to deliver work and they can get financing or they are too small to be financed by a big institution as well and uh, in this sense we also work with with experts on how to prepare those projects or how to create a, a network of you know uh, actors to, to to combine it into a bigger scalable project um, and we we do that with with people that we work with um, we also work like I will refer now to the project that I know like in and out it's a support for Polish called regions project that we did and there was a lot of capacity building there were a few manuals toolkits and so on but also what we did we sat down with Wielkopolska region and we designed with them um, helped them, help them design let's say um, the outplacement project so the project that supports 
workers that will lose their jobs or the workers that work in uh, like um, uh, at the contractors of the mine so all the the, the, the indirect workers as well um, and this is not like you know the program that is that was mentioned that uh, is prepared addressed directly to the miners from the government, not the severance payments, not the, you know, early retirement pay. This is all separate. This is, uh, this is there and, uh, you know, countries have tools to do that. But from our experience in the past and what we did in those reports from three, four years ago, we've learned that this is not enough, basically, to give people some cash or a check for, you know, big amount and then they don't really know what to do. Also, those are people that are proud of their, you know, job and uh, this feeling of being, you know, very uh, proud of, you know, part of the community. And they are being lost without this job. And also they retire early, you know. Honestly, like, look, average age of retiring minor is between 40 and 50. And those people are too young to basically just sit at home and do nothing. and often those programs offer them basically that. So what we want to do is to give them counseling and uh, other ways to find a job that maybe, okay, it's, maybe it won't be that the same because in their eyes nothing will be the same as a minor job. I mean, if you know minors, you know what I mean. Uh, but it will give them something to do because we've seen that people that basically stayed home and had nothing to do basically um, it, it destroyed their lives, their family lives, it destroyed their way of thinking about the world. There were some, you know, difficult situation. The unemployment kicked in a few years after the transition. So I think it is very important and this is also what we do. We, we work with regional authorities um, to prepare a plan that would basically um, encourage them to not only take the, you know, big check of leaving the mine, but also get involved in other um, activities. We also went through the uh, effort of screening of, I think, more than 2,000 profiles of jobs with the skills that are attached to them to kind of show the pathway which professions are the closest to the professions that you can see in mines. So this is all like what we have done and it's available. And if you're interested, please contact us. We can contact you with our experts that, that uh, are in charge of those programs. Uh, and of course, uh, this is the, the, the people and communities pillar because uh, you mentioned that there's not enough people and communities, but they are actually at the center of everything what we do. But uh, in that sense also, I think that land repurposing also is for the people because they live next to those mines usually. And if we don't want them to you know, disappear or depopulate area, we have to make those areas livable and uh, to create nice, conditions for them to live, whether it's like green space, of course it can be because sometimes there's nothing else you can do with that, but also attract investment. So um, here kudos to Wolf who uh, worked with, with other experts who prepared a way to analyze those post mining lands to try to scoop up, you know, from, from that areas land that can be used for business, for uh, residential areas, for something basically, you know, that can give some economic impulse. So in this sense, uh, it, reclamation is not only to bring this area to safety, but also to give impetus for other economic uh, activities and therefore economic uh, diversification. What we also see important is like the, in, in the sense of capacity building is to for people to understand that you have to look at the pool of skills you have you know, on the ground, and then to look for sectors that can, you know, respond to that. Because if you start inventing what would you want, you know, your region to become completely detached from what you have as an asset, then it doesn't really later match together. So in that sense, um, there is a need for good governance, delegation of, you know, activities, building teams that can deliver, and we support all those actions in all those three pillars. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Magda. And uh, building on that, uh, I have a question to, to, to Mayor uh, Bajtarevic. Uh, assuming uh, something which is unimaginable, which means that you have as much money as you need, as much funds as you need, and then you have the support at the national or, if you wish, strategic level, 
I mean, do you have a, enough expertise with the local community to implement the uh, just transition? This is what Magda has mentioned, yes? I mean, that uh, in the end, you need people capable of implementing this, yes? I mean, money is a big problem, of course, always. You can do nothing without funds. Legal framework is also a problem, yes? But in the end, just it takes people, good people. So do you have them on the ground, or do you have, like Aurora mentioned, you know, some vocational centers, so you train people? I mean, what are your, what is your assessment of, your, of the skills of people, your experts, people working in the industry now with regard to the uh, just transition? U ova zadnja dva dana sam shvatio da je ovdje najgore biti političar. Ja bi sad pričao kao običan građanin jer, jer načelnik na ovim sesijama nije nikako lako. Šalim se, naravno. Ja smatram da, da bez obzira da li imamo sredstva, bez obzira da li imamo i konkretne projekte, Moramo se malo vratiti korak nazad, moramo, se, moramo uključiti uh, akademsku zajednicu, moramo uključiti svo moguće znanje koje imamo, konkretno Bosna i Hercegovina. Naravno da općina, kakav kao mala općina, nema dovoljno svojih izgrađenih kapaciteta u smislu stručnjaka koji bi mogli provesti sve projekte ili sve naše želje i zamisli koje imamo. Uh, mi, na, 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 znajući, možda nismo ni znali da radimo tranziciju, ali već godinama zaista imamo u, u, u lokalnoj zajednici neke naše programe koji nas evo indirektno spremaju za neke stvari koje nas čekaju. Mi smo iz tog, iz tog cilja krenuli od, od obrazovanja. A, nije, nije nadležnost lokalne zajednice, grada, općine, ali smo prilikom stipendisanja naših učenika i studenata a, već targetovali zahvaljujući privrednom sektoru i akademskoj zajednici deficitarna zanimanja koja trebamo e, finansirati da bismo izgradili stručnjake o kojima sada pričamo. Da bismo tim mladim ljudima u stvari ponudili perspektivu i pratili ih i financijski u ostvarivanju njihovih privatnih biznisa jer smatram da je to, to način kako trebamo graditi našu budućnost lokalne zajednice. E, nisam pobornik da se treba vršiti prekvalifikacija postojeće radne snage u rudnicima, jer ćemo time ostati i bez ono malo kvalitetne radne snage koja trenutno radi u rudnicima, ali da trebamo napraviti strateški plan kako te ljude sutra prekvalifikovati u druge poslove i zaposliti, to da. Kada bi mi sad stavili sav novac ovog svijeta, mi imamo želje, imamo planove, imamo projekte koje bismo ponudili, ali definitivno mala lokalna zajednica koja ima 30 i nešto hiljada stanovnika ne bi imala dovoljno kapaciteta ljudskog, prije svega u ljudima, onda u znanju, da bismo mogli implementirati takve neke projekte koje je trebali. Nama zaista, pored sredstava, usuđujem se reći u Bosni i Hercegovini i drugim, trebaju nam kompetencije, trebaju nam dobra iskustva. Trebaju nam iskustva koja smo slušali danas od naših kolega iz drugih, drugih država, drugih lokalnih zajednica. Um, općina Kakan je bila dio razmjene gdje smo išli u Bugarsku, Staru Zagoru. Vidjeli smo neke dobre primjere, ali moram biti iskreni, vidjeli smo neke primjere koji nas, nisu nas oduševili, ali su to i nama dobri primjeri da znamo kako nećemo neke stvari raditi, odnosno kako neke stvari treba da izbjegnemo. U stvari ovo, ovo danas što smo ova dva dana, što smo ovdje, što razgovaramo je nama neko iskustvo da, da svom ovom osoblju koje je organiziralo budemo možda i neki vjetar u leđa, da ovaj projekat koji sam evo iz nekoliko uglova čuo da će prestati ili stati ili će se pretvoriti u nešto drugo, da u stvari učinimo sve da ovo nestane. Jer ako želimo provesti pravednu tranziciju, ne samo u Bosni i Hercegovini, na čitavom Zapadnom Balkanu, svo moguće iskustvo koje možemo dobiti i imati i imamo nam treba kroz ovakav vid susreta, kroz ovakav vid panela. Bez toga bojim se da će se ova pravedna tranzicija, namjerno neću da spomenem energetsku, ne volim tu riječ, iz jednog prostog razloga, mi govorimo o pravednoj tranziciji, zatvaramo jedan rudnik u kaknju, na granici općine kakan se otvara novi rudnik. Ne uglja, nego barita, cinka, olova, u kojem znam da ima financijera koji su ovi dva dana i danas pričali na ovim panelima. Zato, mi, zato ja ne volim riječ energetska, ali kad pričamo o pravednoj 
onda moramo razmišljati i razgovarati o ovo čemu je Mirza govorio, o ljudima, ljudskim sudbinama, socijalnog aspektu i onome što je najbitnije za te ljude, a to je ekonomija i inače život koji moraju da rade. Tako da svako iskustvo koje sam danas čuo, koje imam priliku podijeliti sa kolegama, dobro nam je došlo i ovaj, eto ako išta znači, predlažem da ovo nastavi dalje u kojoj formi će to biti, ali zaista iz jedne male lokalne zajednice mislim da trebamo svi kazati da treba nastaviti dalje, jer bojim se da ako ne budemo imali, ne budemo slušali ta iskustva, da onda ni pravednu tranziciju nećemo provesti u najbolj mogućem roku. Okay, thank you, thank, thank, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, uh, now I'd like to go, go back on to, to, to Aurora because from what you have said, it seems actually that, well, everything's, everything goes well or even better than well in Kosovo. So, so my question is, how do you know, is it really that you generated you know, the momentum and now you just work with just people, you got experts, you train people, and there are no problems. I mean, there are no, you know, like some uh, uh, you know, clouds on the horizon you were afraid of? Um, <coughs> first of all, we're a new country, so the transition, the word is all well known <laughs> for us. And now the energy c transition comes with it. Um, this has positive and some negative effects as well, but the positive is that we're learning to absorb a lot uh, in less time. So that's the good part of it. And I'd like to link uh, this with what is needed as well and link uh, um, with the previous uh, speaker and your question. So you said, let's assume money is there. Um, I personally believe money is there. We have many frameworks and investment windows that we can rely on, uh, but the main thing that I would say is highly important is the power of absorption. And I think in Kosovo, the administration is really learning how to do it. Um, so we have people willing to um, give all the efforts for energy transition, also considering the energy crisis as well, which has shown us that this is an important sector and we have to look forward to it. Um, so, of course, there are boring days, bad, bad days for everyone at work, but uh, this is, from my perspective, being part of the administration now uh, and uh, part of the Ministry of Economy, I feel the good vibe in there. So we're open as a ministry to every stakeholder, um, uh, including here, of course, the local level, the academia, um, the NGO, the so, uh, 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 and the uh, private sector. So we're trying to be inclusive and transparent. So in every process, we are um, including and having consultations with all these stakeholders so that we know what's going on in the society and what's the uh, citizen's perspective and then incorporate that all in, in our uh, implementing uh, implementation of the projects, etc. So what I'd like to, to conclude is that, um, and maybe keep it short, short uh, for the sake of, of uh, other speakers as well. I'd say the power of, of, of absorption. Uh, we could see so many IFIs and other uh, representatives here uh, speaking of opportunities. So I think opportunities are there, but there are so many we're sometimes forgetting half of them. <laughs> it's, it's good to remember to do a bit more research and then to go um, step by step. So after funding, I'd say it's the implementation and then the promotion. From that implementation and promotion both uh, uh, hand in hand, then take the lessons learned. Uh, link again with a, with a uh, previous speaker. Um, learn from other mistakes as well. So being open to other countries, to other stakeholders and save time because learning from other uh, others mistakes would save time and money as well um, and then uh, know-how sharing and go back to promotion funding implementation again so this is a cycle uh, with 
adding here all the stakeholders, as I mentioned, the collaboration between the central level, the local level, the academia, the NGOs, and the private sector would absolutely be uh, a full package to move on with projects um, regarding the energy sector and this transition. I'm saying projects and mentioning, emphasizing it for the sake of uh, highlighting again then, at least in Kosovo, we have the strategic documents now and uh, that's a tick and now we have to jump on implementing okay so basically what you mean apart from a strategy you need a plan and a structure that is able to absolutely yeah. this plan. okay thank you uh mirza you, you you promise you, you you say you know something positive to conclude just about the prospects of the just transition energy transition in well, as uh, in the region so i participated staying. in the first online conference of this of this series because I have experience in uh, positive experience in making transition in the city after the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina I come from city of Tuzla and the leading industry city was uh, white mining salt chemical industry so we had about 4,000 people employed in the chemical industry there was a high level production uh, institute one of the world known institutes 150 people work in the institute, it's university center. Our university started as a coal mining uh, and chemical industry. So during the war, the industry just stopped and never, never restarted again. So you lose 4,000 jobs. Okay, some people went to the work more than five years working nothing. <coughs> they were called workers on waiting. So they were awaited, but waiting, but People realize that's that's gone. That's something which probably will happen in Ukraine or uh, North Macedonia. It's gone. It's easier. Uh, what is the lessons learned from there? You need a mayor who has ambition, who has a dream, local government, and the person. We did have a mayor who had a dream. Then you need the experts, and then you need capacity. You need human capacity. Uh, the result, 20 years after, we have new industry. Not chemical, zero. Even the, coal mine, even the salt mine is closed. So the vision of the mayor was tourism, and it's one of the social economic aspects, which was 100% uh, developed by the public money without IFIs, without any loans, credits, step by step. There are four lakes now, salt lakes in the city center, first one lake, then second lake, the third lake. It's a process. You have to have the vision and you have to have the process. And we are basically talking local economic development. We are talking about restructuring. We are talking about management of change. We are talking about experimenting. So the suggestion to the mayors, go with the small, easy to fail, safe to fail project. Have a dream. My dream, I was a dean at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, my dream came to be realized with 2,000 people who are today working in IT sector. And I'm not an IT engineer, I'm power engineer. So you have really to think what will be jobs of the 21st century. And then you will realize that one thing is reskill, retrain the people who are employed. By the way, let me share the information with you. 65% of people in Bosnia and Herzegovina that work in the mining industry are not productive. They are overhead. And when the mayor said, don't retrain the miners because we don't have miners, we will stop working unless we have a plan how to phase down, how to go down slowly. I would advise people to ask for the expertise what is possible to do in a local community, not with the local people employed in the mines, for their green digital future in Europe. Very ambitious. That's my suggestion. And it's experience. So optimistic. Uh, it's possible. So even though I'm not IT engineer, even though I'm power engineer, and see even today 
I'm very proud that, that, that we had the courage to start something like we had a dream. Okay, thank you. That was positive. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Magda, okay, I, I just put a very briefly, please. Li little comment, mm -hmm. because we also worked in Silesia, and you know we did the preference surveys among communities, and uh, different results came out. But we then also did one in Ruda Śląska, a particular mining city with four coal mines, and actually the the, the 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 results were a bit different than the overall ones. And there they actually cared for you know the types of job to be green. They didn't have problem with going to you know a renewable side of energy. And I think looking into those community preferences are is really really important because uh, sometimes we think that it's like this, and when we actually ask people, uh, the results are different. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, building on the Schlonsk example, uh, Piotr, if you could, well, I mean, what are the, because you mentioned, I mean, first of all, it is a kind of a success story in Poland, indeed, and we have a, uh, we may have these days that we do have a consensus on, 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 the, on the energy transformation in Poland, and there is the money, yes, I mean, the Just Transition Fund, but I mean, how, and the expectations are high, actually. Many people believe that, well, with this money, you know, with this consensus and with a bit of political will, we can really, you know, deliver. And uh, is it so? I mean, are there any problems you, you, can, you can see in the future? Or? Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with uh, what Mirza said. Uh, we need uh, some visionaries, dreamers, especially uh, among young people, and we should help them to make these dreams come true. A good example is at Glibice, for example, in, in, in our region. Uh, on the former coal mining uh, area, there is uh, um, the place for startups, and we've got a space company over there, which launched this month the satellite that allows to uh, make teledetection uh, imaging for uh, observing the, the Earth. I believe that. Uh, um, when money is on the table, the most important thing is to engage all stakeholders and to think about, about uh, this human capital, because it was mentioned many times today, uh, we should take care about uh, uh, the whole uh, human capital, not only young people, because they can leave to big cities to change the place where they want to live, because they take, about the, uh, take care about the uh, quality of life. We should help to create this good quality, this uh, uh, ecosystem that is good for them to develop. And I think that we've got m many examples in our region. Of course, there are also some uh, um, lessons learned uh, that we would like uh, to um, talk about and to uh, say our other uh, partners try to avoid it. Uh, we've just started this year the next um, project following the, uh, the, the project I mentioned before uh, that is run from Visegrad Fund and um, we were discussing with a Ukrainian partner, with the uh, person representing NGO network and we've asked them, how do you think, what is important for you, uh, you've participated in two uh, study tours in Poland and they told us, okay, let uh, we would like to know also what kind of mistakes you've made because we would like to avoid it so let's share not only with good practices but also with some mistakes let's learn how to avoid it and uh, let's remember that even uh, countries that uh, um, are beneficiaries of jtf also have to involve our stakeholders because we also need to implement projects that are dedicated uh, to build uh, human capital. Thank you very much, uh, Piotr. And we actually just yeah, just in time, but if there is only one question to the panel, then I would uh, yes, the gentleman here. Yes. It's here in the middle. Okay. Could you raise your hand again so they can see you? Okay. Thank you. Dozvolite mi prije svega da srdačno pozdravim uvaženi auditorij na čelu sa moderatorom današnjih panel diskusije i naših uvaženih paneliste. 
Moje ime je Began Muhić i dolazim iz grada Živinice, Bosna i Hercegovina, gdje sam gradonačelnik od nepunu godinu dana nakon preranog preseljenja našeg gradonačelnika dr. Samira Kamenjakovića. Mi u Živinicama smo se zavisili u novoj situaciji, da smo imali prije vremene izbore. Nastavljamo kontinuitet saglašenih ciljeva i politike i kada su u pitanju pravedna tranzicija i energetska tranzicija, po mnogima grad Živinice prednjači u odnosu na okruženje. Zahvalan sam na dosadašnjoj saradnji institucijama, prije svega Evropskoj banci za obnovi razvoj, Evropskoj investicijskoj banci, svjetskoj banci na realizaciji brojnih projekata u Živinicama. Po pitanju dvodnevne konferencije, jako sam zahvalan i dodatno ohrabri novim informacijama. Jako nam je dragocjeno i zahvaljujem se na pozivu. Moje mišljenje je zamolio bih na nekoliko sugestija i jedno pitanje. Dakle, sugestija, jako bi korisno bilo da, upravo o čemu je govorio načelnik Kaknja, da probamo razdvojiti ciljeve i politike pravedne tranzicije područja bogatim ugljem od energetske tranzicije. Moje mišljenje je da energetsku tranziciju je puno lakše i jednostavnije riješiti od pravedne tranzicije područja bogatim ugljem. Ciljevi nam nisu isti. Evo, imali smo prethodnim panel diskusijama gdje je predstavnik elektor privede Bosne i Hercegovine govorio. Ja razumijem da oni imaju ciljeve politiku da proizvode i ostvaraju profit, proizvode energiju i njima je puno lakše izvršiti transformaciju proizvodnje energije iz fosilnih goriva u obnovljive izvore. Međutim, pravednu tranziciju lokalne zajednice ne obuhvata samo profit i proizvodnju, nego jedan kompletan sistem gdje moramo vrenuti ono krajnjima, to je o ljudima o čemu ste govorili. Mi u živjenicama moramo hrabiti naše ljude. Imamo 1500 rudara koji uposljeno dva rudnika, proizvodimo milijoni 500 tona godišnje uglja. Ovisni smo od uglja jer jedini način da izvršimo topifikaciju za grijavanje daljinsko je preko uglja. Rudnik je za svoje dosadašnje godine eksploatacije uništio, degradirao 15 miliona metara kvadratnih zemljišta koje su bilo bradvije površine. Mi trebamo pristupiti pravednoj tranziciji na način da postanemo neovisni energetski od uglja. Mi trenutno u živincama smo isključivo ovisni u uglju. Ne postoje nikakva alternativa da izvršimo zagrijavanje daljinskog grijanja. Zbog toga bi dobro bilo, možda inicijativa moja, da se razmotri mogućnost. Sva ova područja bogata ugljem. Siguran sam da imamo svi isti problem. Da smo svi energetski ovisni u uglju kada je u pitanju zagrijavanje topifikacije grada. Može li se jedinstven projekat za sve te gradove da mapiramo energetske potencijale, da tražimo alternativu, da isfinansiramo i mi vlastnim sredstvima i uz pomoć međunarodnih finanskih institucija da riješimo toj način i to je direktna smanjenje ovisnosti o uglju. Također, mi moramo pristupiti jednom ozbiljnim studijskom uređenju degradiranih površina u svim sredinama gdje imaju uhalj. To elektroprivode nije interes. Da bi to uradili, to područje moramo stvarati kao poslovne zone koje ćemo pošljavati ljude koji će sutra ostati bez posla u našim rudnicima. Da takav način, sličan način, dakle, mi možemo konkretnim primjerima utisati zaista da vršimo jednu pravednu tranziciju energetskih područja i u tom kontekstu vas molim da uključite naše vrste stručnjake, kao što je naš uvaženi profesor dr. Mirza Košljugić, koji zna suštinu naših problema, da često budemo, da budu aktivni sudionici u kreiranju zvančnih politika. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't want to be rude, but just our time is, you know, over. So, if we... Ako dozvolite, još samo jedna inicijativa, zamolio bi... No, I... Sorry, just... There was... Okay. Yeah. Very much. Okay. I'm sorry for that, but we just, you know, it's... Yeah. We should, we should finish then, and, and I thought it's going to be questioned to the panel, but nevertheless, uh, I mean, before we go to the concluding remarks uh, and of the session, uh, let me, well, first say that, well, there was a lot of, you know, 
different things which were mentioned during our panel, but the one which is like, you know, really the lesson I would take it uh, as a kind of lesson is the local perspective. I mean, whatever we do, we have to not only act locally, but also think locally, which means for the prism of local communities, yes, because sometimes, I mean, things which are uh, things from local perspective look very much differently than, you know, from this, you know, strategic or uh, global or regional perspective. So, uh, again, without uh, further ado, I mean, let's uh, please join me and thank our panelists for the excellent work. <laughs> Hope to, to meet you perhaps uh, next year. And uh, now I give the floor. And we, do, we, do we have a technical break or no. just? No? No? Okay. So, yep. Yeah, thank you. So, the session is over. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, friends, colleagues, uh, it has been quite an intense journey, the last day and a half, but we're actually at the last stage of our journey, but it is a very important stage of the journey. As the closing remarks are being made uh, by the European Commission, uh, and I'm delighted to say that we have two speakers from the European Commission um, who will obviously wrap things up uh, in regard to reflections on the past, but also reflections on the future of the initiative. Um, the first speaker is Veronique Marx, and uh, she is a well-known face. She was on one of the panels yesterday, uh, but she has also been heavily involved in the initiative over the last few years. As you know, Veronique is the team leader for Just Transition and Energy Poverty in DG Energy. In her role, she coordinates a variety of programs on coal phase-out, regional exchanges, between co-regions, as well as the Commission's response to energy poverty in the EU. I'm delighted to also say we, the second speaker is Richard Masha, and Richard uh, took the Western Balkans Investment Framework Head of Sector post in DG Near in September 21, after a return from the EU delegations in the Western Balkans, where he was posted for 12 years. So he's very familiar with the geography which we've been talking about. Just by way of background, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Richard served as the head of cooperation. Uh, and prior to Sarajevo, uh, Richard was posted uh, as head of infrastructure and agricultural section in the EU delegation in Serbia, after also working in Croatia, the delegation in Croatia. So we have two excellent uh, speakers, uh, contributors, to give the final reflections uh, from the European Commission. So I'll ask Veronique first to take to the stage. Dear participants and colleagues, dear guests, good evening. I'm pleased to deliver the closing remarks of this annual meeting of the Initiative for Coal Regions in Transition in the Western Balkans and Ukraine. Our aim with this initiative was to support the coal regions in transition in their move away from coal in a fair and just manner by sharing our experiences and learning from each other. Today, while the transition is ongoing, I'm proud to see the progress that has been done, the significant growth of the community of practitioners and the collaboration between EU coal regions and the coal regions in the Western Balkans and Ukraine that this initiative was able to foster. In the past three years, we have learned a lot from each other. Um, we have witnessed the strong interest of the local communities to be engaged and the importance of building bottom-up processes in the just transition. Most of the communities involved in the coal region-to-region -region exchange program continue in contact with their counterparts to further develop joint activities. 
And this is exactly what we were aiming at, creating and empowering communities and allowing them to take ownership of their transition processes while providing EU support. The importance of this goes beyond the just transition or any other policy development. Such community building contributes to establishing ties between the neighborhood region and the EU, and therefore advancing the coming together of both our regions and building towards a future together. In that respect, we have been contributing to what President von der Leyen referred to as a true union of people when she spoke of the future of the enlargements at her State of the Union address in September. Through this initiative, we have tried to put into practice the different aspects of a just transition, the value of inclusiveness and of stakeholder involvement to gather different perspectives and ensure that all the voices and the needs in the transition are heard and are taken into account in the designing phase of policies. Moreover, it is crucial to improve communication strategies to facilitate broader stakeholder participation and increase the public awareness of the importance of the transition process. Inclusiveness also means communication. This is also what is taught at the Coal Regions Learning Academy, developed by the World Bank and the College of Europe with the active support of the Commission. Let me remind you that all these webinars will continue to be online, with subtitles in all the official languages of the Western Balkans and Ukraine. Now it is crucial, of course, to focus on the implementation in order to apply all the knowledge and the expertise that we have gathered over the past three years and ensure a just transition in the EU and in our neighbors. So let me turn, towards, uh, let me turn to the work that is ahead of us. As we have heard in the previous sessions today and yesterday, the Western Balkans and Ukraine have a great solar, wind and hydropower potential in the clean energy transition away from fossil fuels. The energy transition should thus be seen more like an opportunity than a burden, while of course we do need to ensure that no one is left behind and that all can benefit from these opportunities. Renewables also contribute to energy security in various ways, by diversifying energy sources, reducing dependence on fossil fuels from third countries, enhancing resilience to climate change, and providing access to clean, affordable energy while promoting economic stability and innovation. This is why an accelerated deployment of renewables is key, and why the energy markets and networks should be supported in their openness and competitiveness. For these opportunities to materialize, the Western Balkans and Ukraine have done a lot of the legislative groundwork. In December last year, for example, the electricity integration package was included in the Energy Community Ministerial Acquis and the, and the historical agreement on the 2030 energy and climate targets complemented the clean energy package legislation that was adopted in 21. Timely and full implementation of this legislation is a key condition to integrate the Western Balkans into the EU electricity market and to put you on the same path as the EU towards decarbonization. The, EU, the European Commission is committed to supporting the Western Balkans and Ukraine in their path towards EU membership and climate neutrality by 2050. This is confirmed by the EU's substantial financial support. I will not go into further details, as we are lucky to have with us our esteemed colleague from Digineer, who I am sure will provide further details on this. Regarding the energy sector, however, we will continue supporting the clean energy transition in the region through substantial investments into energy efficiency and renewables, and also continue supporting other regional programs such as the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, the Climate Neutral and Smart Cities Mission, and the Horizon Europe. Also smaller programs will continue being implemented, such as the flagship um, project Ray of Hope that donates solar panels to Ukraine. We expect that the solar panels donated to Ukraine, approximately 5,700, with a total capacity of around two megawatt will be installed by this winter. So let me close this intervention by reconfirming that the European Commission will continue to stand by you. Future activities will build on the experience of the initiative of the coal regions in transition in the Western Balkans and Ukraine and ensure continuity using the knowledge and the expertise already gathered and further expanded in the scope and the activities. The Energy Community Secretariat and the international financial institutions will continue as key partners to support the just transition in the region through a comprehensive approach and compassing support in the energy, employment, industrial and economic sectors. We count on your engagement and enthusiasm 
we count on the engagement and the enthusiasm of all of you, on all the initiative's principals and all other stakeholders, practitioners and decision makers to continue supporting a just and fair transition in the region. But before now giving the floor to my esteemed colleague, Richard Masha from Digineer, let me particularly thank the Secretariat of the Initiative and the six international partners, the World Bank, the Energy Community Secretariat, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the European Investment Bank, Poland's National Fund, and the College of Europe. Our collaborative approach was the enabler of the initiative and this annual event. Finally, I would also like to extend my thanks to my own commission colleagues, especially in Digineer, who we have been working closely together in the implementation of this initiative. Thank you. Dear participants, uh, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome also from the engineer side to the last annual meeting of the initiative for coal regions in transition in the Western Balkans and Ukraine in this format. But it is for sure not the last event organized and supported uh, by the European Commission to support just transition in the region since we are planning future initiatives uh, for the Western Balkans, but I will come to that a bit uh, later. I hope you had uh, uh, a successful two days which aim to cover all aspects of the, that the initiative has, had wor has worked on uh, in the past three years, which Veronique also mentioned in her intervention. Uh, also from, from our side, big thanks uh, to the six international partners to the, to the initiative for their work in the last three years on the project. Together with the Secretariat, you have been an important part of the initiative and the design of this annual meeting. We will sure continue to work together on Just Transition as we focus more on implementation. Also, uh, in a part, thanks to the momentum that the initiative has created. At more or global level, there is also a new momentum for the enlargement and, in particular, an opportunity for Western Balkan partners to advance on their convergence path towards the EU through key reforms uh, and investments in the strategic uh, areas. The GDP of Western Balkan economies is, is at 35% uh, of the EU average. In order to catch up with the EU member states, we really have to get the region advancing on socio-economic integration. On the one hand, access to the European Union single market should be enhanced. And on the other hand, the integration within the region should be further deepened through the common regional market. This is the political ambition of the new growth plan for the Western Balkans, which has been proposed by the European Commission just this month. To make it happen, uh, the growth plan proposes to complement the currently uh, available IPA3 funds with a new financial package of 6 billion euros, of which 2 billion are in grants and the rest through the loans for the period 2024-2027. This financial package, the proposed reform and growth facility, is conditioned. It's conditioned on the socio-economic and political reforms. The Western Balkan partners are called to identify the key reforms in different areas that would boost their socio-economic convergence towards the EU accession. And green and just transition is obviously deeply linked into these efforts and the region's economic integration with the EU. The reform and growth facility prioritizes accelerating the green transition, particularly in the energy sector, and places a focus on implementation of national energy and climate plans to achieve the predefined 2030 targets. We will continue to insist on inclusion of just transition as an important element in the reform ag agendas. Let's also not forget the economic and investment plan with its flagship investments that remains still 
of high importance for the economic development of the region and the main vehicle, financial vehicle, uh, that provided assistance from our side to the energy sector. This also includes the 2022 energy support package for the Western Balkans to support businesses and vulnerable citizens in the aftermath of the energy price hikes in Europe. And uh, finally, you may have heard uh, already that we are uh, also planning a just transition initiative for the Western Balkans under the IPA 2024 that we hope should start already uh, in the course towards the end of, of next year, which would build on and expand on the CRIT uh, initiative. It will strengthen engagement with the private sector, with the IFIs, as well as municipalities, and to support implementation of pilot projects in the regions that want to phase out uh, from coal and carbon heavy industries. This will also include continued cooperation with the principles of the, the CRIT initiative on concrete implementation of various just transition initiatives. Further on, the EU continued support to Ukraine is unshakable. With the latest payment of October, the EU overall support to Ukraine amounts to almost 83 billion euros. And in addition, the European Commission proposed up to 50 billion euros for the following years until 2027. Continuing the cooperation between the EU and the Western Balkans and Ukraine is essential for a prosperous common future now more than ever. The transition cannot succeed unless it is fair and just, leaving no region, no industry, no worker or no community behind. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Veronique, for those uh, closing remarks. Um, and I think it very much echoes what's been discussed uh, over the last day and a half. Much has happened over the last three years. Um, and I, because of time, I'm not going to recap. But there's a consensus that a lot has been achieved. There is momentum, but there is an acceptance that we have to build on this momentum. There is the opportunity for sure to build on that momentum. There has to be, though, greater focus on implementation, reform, and acceleration of the process. But there is commitment and desire for continuity and ongoing engagement. And I think that's not only from the European Commission, but the other six partner organizations. I thought that came across strongly over the last day and a half. So I think we're going to leave it there. However, before you depart, we have a closing slido and we would like to just ask you one question before you can all go your separate ways. And the question is, in one word, what are the key takeaways of this event? So if you could please register on Slido if you have not already done so, and just say in one word, what are the key takeaways for you? of this event, and I'm delighted to see awareness is right up there. Action. Community. I was hoping for another A so we could have alliteration, but uh, awareness, action, demand for support. Community. People. Very powerful. I think that's been through all the discussions that just transition is people-centered, education, strong link to people, human capital, community, people. It's just shouting out there. I'll leave it for a few more seconds because more is coming in. But it really does actually reflect very well what we've been discussing, vision, scaling up, knowledge exchange, capacity building community, collaboration. Well, I think what we have is actually almost an emergent work plan <laughs> for 2024 and onwards. And I think actually there is a commitment across the partners, the principals, to keep that work plan going. But 
it's incredible how people is just right at the center of things. And I think that's been through all the discussions. Okay, I think we will leave it there. There's many interesting uh, potential narratives within these words, but I think we have a very clear and very insightful summary of what's been discussed. I would now, I'm conscious that many people are having to head to the airport, uh, so I would like to actually just sum up uh, by giving thanks, bring the, the meeting to a close by giving thanks. I'd like to thank the speakers and the panelists over the last day and a half. I think it's been a very rich set of inputs and I was impressed by the degree of candor. Um, I would like to thank you, the delegates. Uh, your inputs have been very much appreciated. There was always an energy in the room. Last year when we had the annual meeting, there was a real energy in the room and it's wonderful to see that energy is still amongst this community. So let's not let that dissipate in the coming months and year. I'd like to obviously thank my colleagues in, this, in the Secretariat, the Crit Secret Secretariat for the Western Balkans and Ukraine. And I'd obviously like to thank the team who pulled together this conference because it has gone very smoothly. I have one last request before we all go our separate ways. And that is that you fill in the survey in regard to your views on the event. But just before you do that, I would like to just give a round of applause to the panelists, the contributors, to yourselves and to the organizer organizers. Thank you.